Good morning. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our results presentation for the year 2023. This is Ignacio Castejón speaking. It's a real pleasure being with all of you today again. Uh, our chairman and CEO, Mauricio Lucena, will host the call together with Carlos Gallego, head of IR, and myself. Uh, now I'll give the floor to Mauricio. Thank you very much, Mauricio. Thank you, Ignacio. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us uh, today. Uh, I think that uh, we can confirm that uh, we are very proud and very satisfied with the results that uh, we have presented uh, today. I will start, as usual, uh, commenting the key highlights, uh, and then I will give the floor back to Ignacio Castejón, and then uh, I, I can, uh, again, of course, uh, join you uh, in the Q&A section. I will start with uh, traffic. IANA Group traffic increased uh, year on year by 16% to 314 million passengers, which uh, represented an increase of 2.3% compared to 2019. And if we go to the Spanish uh, network, uh, traffic increased 2.9% compared uh, to 2019 uh, and reached uh, I would say uh, a very good level, uh, which uh, uh, which uh, was uh, a record, and it was uh, 283.2 million uh, passengers. Domestic traffic increased by 8.2 percent, while uh, international traffic increased 0.5 uh, percent compared to 2019. Luton, uh, the Luton, uh, London Luton airport traffic uh, was not uh, as good as uh, the average of uh, the IANA network, but uh, in the context of the UK uh, traffic, uh, I think it was a uh, normal uh, behavior. It uh, reached 90% of the traffic of uh, 2019, and uh, in contrast, uh, in Brazil, our uh, A and B concession uh, increased 6.3% compared to 2019 uh, levels. I move now to financials. Ordinary revenue stood at uh, a little bit more of uh, 5 billion euros, which is uh, uh, another record. Uh, I, I not, aeronautical revenue stood at 2 0.8 billion euros, commercial revenue 1.5 billion euros, and real estate revenue 105.5 million euros. As you can see uh, uh, at uh, our uh, presentation, total, total operating expenses stood at uh, almost 3 billion euros, uh, specifically 2.9 billion euros. This variation, as we have tried to clearly explain on the presentation, reflects uh, principally the reversal of the impairment of the airports of, uh, north of uh, the northeast of Brazil, which uh, amounts uh, to 155.5 million euros, and uh, secondly, the decrease of 100. 21.2 million euros in the electricity bill, which uh, was uh, really good news after uh, after the nightmare of uh, 2021. I'm, I'm of, of course referring to uh, the electricity bill. All in all, the EBITDA for the period uh, came at uh, 3 billion euros and the EBITDA margin closed at 58.8%, uh, and if we, as we should do, exclude the reversal of the set impairment, the EBITDA would have been 55.8%. Uh, uh, again, 
again, I'm uh, referring to uh, the the AENA group, not uh, not Spain. Uh, all in all, again, the net profit uh, produced by the company reached 1.6, uh, a little bit more of uh, 1.6 1, uh, billion euros, which is uh, again uh, the highest uh, net profit in AENA's history. I now move to the, the commercial activity. Uh, the commercial business uh, behaved uh, very, very well. First, uh, the commercial uh, sales exceeded 2019 by 17%. Second, the ratio of uh, sales per passenger uh, was 14% higher than in 2019. And uh, third, the variable and fixed uh, rents invoiced uh, surpassed 2019 figures by 21.8%. Uh, uh, I would also like to highlight that uh, at the present, uh, at the present time, we are uh, ready to award in the coming months. Uh, the contracts for the rent uh, for, for the rent a car activity, and uh, you know uh, you also know that uh, in 2024 we will put in the market uh, the 13 uh, percent of the specialty shops business and the uh, nine percent of the food and beverage uh, business. On the other hand, uh, I would also like to highlight that uh, the duty-free business, uh, and in this case I'm uh, referring to the variable income of the Canarian and Barcelona lots, exceeded uh, the minimum annual, annual guarantee rents uh, in 2023, and this is uh, the first time ever that uh, the mentioned two lots simultaneously invoice the variable income. Uh, of course, uh, you can anticipate that uh, we are highly proud of uh, this achievement. Uh, and uh, finally, I would like uh, to underline a few important uh, milestones. Uh, first of all, uh, tariffs. Uh, I think that uh, it was uh, a remarkable achievement that uh, the 2023, the, excuse me, the 2024 tariffs uh, AENA's uh, proposal was uh, finally approved, mm -hmm. and it was uh, approved uh, by the Spanish government on the um, on the part that affects uh, the inflation, but by especially that the CNMC. Uh, this represents uh, these uh, uh, tariffs uh, represents an increase of 4.09% uh, or uh, in other words 40 cents per passenger and I think that uh, ultimately this uh, tariffs uh, approval reflects the uh, robustness of the regulatory, of the regulatory framework and uh, in uh, general I think that uh, it uh, reflects the solidity of uh, the, the, the law uh, in general in, in Spain. S uh, secondly, POAB, uh, uh, our uh, second concession in uh, Brazil. I would like to underline that uh, in the last quarter of uh, the last uh, year, 2023, we took over the full control of the 11 new airports uh, uh, of AENA in Brazil. Uh, I'm very, very satisfied with uh, the very smooth uh, process. Uh, and I would also add that the Boabe concession, this is the, the name of uh, this uh, new concession that uh, consists uh, of uh, six airports, uh, uh, excuse me, 11 airports, uh, among which, uh, of course, the most important one is uh, the, the Congonhas Airport in Sao Paulo. And uh, I was saying that uh, I, I would say that uh, the concession is performing smoothly according to our business plan. And uh, I 
I would uh, highlight uh, first that in May the Brazilian regulator ANAC granted uh, the operational certification to the airport of Congonhas, and second, uh, the full concession, uh, BOABE, has already uh, submitted the uh, CAPEX projects uh, for the mandatory investment to ANAC, which uh, is uh, very good news. Uh, again, uh, I think that uh, so far the concession is uh, performing uh, adequately. Thirdly, thirdly uh, dividends. Uh, yesterday, as uh, we have uh, publicly announced, the Board of uh, Directors of AENA uh, proposed uh, the approval uh, proposed, excuse me, for approval at the annual general meeting, the payment of a gross dividend of 7.66 euros per share. Again, uh, a new record. And uh, fourthly, uh, concerning ESG, China has been included for the first time in the Dow Jones, uh, Dow Jones Sustainability Index and remains at the FTSE for good. And finally, uh, uh, the, the fifth uh, milestone uh, that I would like to underline uh, is, uh, is about uh, our capital markets. Uh, really. You know that uh, in, uh, excuse me, on uh, the, the 7th of March, uh, we will hold uh, the update of our strategic plan, and I hope to uh, again be in contact uh, with you uh, on that day. Thank you very much. I give the floor back to Ignacio Castejón, and uh, we will move uh, to a more detailed explanation of uh, the considerations that I have tried uh, to convey to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mauricio. Uh, well, hello everyone again. Uh, so what we believe we, we have a set of uh, financial results in front of us that really is a very good one. Uh, you will have seen total revenues have increased by more than 21 percent, EBITDA around 45.4 percent, and net result, net income, 80.9 percent. All of those consolidated figures. Uh, what are the main drivers uh, in our understanding for these achievements? Uh, basically traffic performance, commercial trends, a larger contribution from our international business, and also the OPEX performance with some one-offs in our OPEX operational structure and also on the uh, financial side. Uh, as highlighted by our chairman and CEO, there has been a, a significant uh, impact coming from the reversal of the environment at AMB that has contributed uh, 155 Point, uh, 5 million euros to our consolidated accounts. So excluding that impact, our EBITDA would be at a level of uh, 2,867 million euros. Our margins would be around 55.8, as explained by, by Mauricio. There is another one-off that is a subsidy uh, related to COVID expenses. Uh, that's 45 million euros that have been received by the company in December. This is also affecting our EBITDA and, and our margins. Discounting this uh, subsidy, our EBITDA margin could be at 55.4%. Uh, in the following minutes, uh, very briefly, I'll, I'll try to summarize uh, and focus on these uh, drivers that are behind these, the performance of the company in 2023. Traffic. Uh, Mauricio has already mentioned that traffic recovered in Spain has been 2.9 percent above 2019 levels. Uh, what we have seen through the year is that uh, traffic recovery has improved through the year. We started the first quarter at 101.6 percent versus 2019, and we finished in the last quarter at 108.6 percent. So that the improvement has been uh, happening through the, through the full year 2023. Uh, if we look at the segments, domestic and international, full recovery compared to 2019. 108.2 and 100.5 for domestic and international, respectively. And I'll do that for a sec with respect to these two markets, international and, and domestic. On international, uh, what we have seen is Latin America, North America, and Africa already surpassed 2019 levels. 
and the Europe market at 99.9%, so at 2019 levels, with countries such as Italy, France, the Netherlands, Portugal, uh, materially exceeding 2019 levels. Our two main markets, the UK and Germany, sits, still sits behind 2019 levels, 95 and 91, respectively. However, we have seen in the last quarter a significant improvement with uh, the two markets already performing in that specific quarter above 2019 levels. With respect to airlines, Ryanair has increased the number of passengers uh, coming to our airports by 21.7%, and also IAG Group by 7.3%. So with respect to traffic, a very satisfactory performance. The second driver that uh, we have identified is commercial trends, commercial performance. Mauricio has already explained to us uh, the main trends behind uh, the improvement in variable rents, revenues, and sales. So I'll spend a few minutes talking about some of the main business lines behind those, those big numbers. Duty-free, the largest cate category. And going to the slide, uh, Carlos, 15, sorry, 17. With respect to uh, duty-free, our largest category, Our largest category, uh, sales have performed very positively in 2023, with an increase of almost 15% compared to 2019. What is behind uh, this growth? Basically, uh, the average spending by British passengers. Uh, food and beverage, uh, the revenue in this category increased by 33.4% compared to 2022. Main reasons behind uh, that would explain this, this growth is uh, price, price increases, more transactions, and also new plants being attracted to the airports by our commercial team. The specialty shops was one of the categories that uh, suffered the most during COVID and also because of the commercial trends out of the airports. We are finally seeing this category contributing to the company with 133 million. That's an increase of 47.7 million uh, percent. That's the largest increase uh, this year in all the commercial uh, activities. And what we are seeing is that in airports in which the commercial offer is complete and traffic has recovered, this category is performing very satisfactory. I would like to share that we have managed to add 5,000 square meters to this category through, through the year. Car rental activities. Mauricio already pointed out uh, that uh, in this year, uh, the contracts, uh, because they are expiring in October 2024, will be, will be hopefully awarded. And I would like to share the trend behind this activity uh, that we have seen in 2023. We have seen prices, the uh, number of contracts increasing uh, by nearly 20%, but prices compared to 2022 have gone down. Uh, and this is normal. Uh, prices uh, uh, in 2023 compared to 2019 are still 30% higher. So what, what, uh, this decline in the value of the contracts is basically a reaction of having more supply by the car rental operators available after the crisis in the supply chains have been, have been mitigated. Let me dwell for a sec in VIP services. Uh, this is a category uh, that is already contributing 118 million uh, to AINA. Uh, this line has materially increased this year by 44%. What we have seen, what we have seen is that the largest contributor of this line, that is VIP launches, is uh, performing very, very well with the customer base with, because traffic and higher penetration and average contact prices, average charges that we are, that we are charging in this activity, material increasing. The third uh, reason for the performance of this year is uh, a higher, uh, although still, uh, uh, still at, uh, at levels below 10% of our international activities. Uh, Mauricio pointed out that traffic recovery on Luton is 90%. However, EBITDA is already 20 million higher than in 2019, reaching 108 million, million pounds. If we look at Brazil, the performance of the airports over there from a traffic standpoint is better than comparable airports, uh, similar to, for example, to Recife, to, to Recife, and is performing well ahead of 2019 levels at 106%. EBITDA is counting all the effects of uh, uh, impairment reversals that took place in 2022 and 2023 have grown from 185 million reais to 220 million uh, Brazilian reais. And let me finish with just one sec. I pointed out the fact that uh, Boab, uh, being Congonia the largest airport in that, in that portfolio, is already contributing with just a few weeks of performance 
13 million, 1 3 million of uh, euros to our PNIL. This is still a small number, will be much higher next year because of the 12 months, but it's already a good, a good sign that that is part of our, our activities. Um, the two, uh, the other driver for the performance is, is, is OPEX. Uh, what we have seen in OPEX, in, in OPEX we have seen that uh, it's true that the to at total level, at group level, costs have decreased. Uh, Mauricio has been very clear that there is a very important driver, that is the reversal of the impairment, that is a negative, uh, is, a, is a minus cost, is a negative cost, so affecting positively. But uh, we have also been managing costs very carefully and trying to mitigate all what's happening in, in the airport industry and also in the economy in general because of inflation, because of salary increases going up, because of the inflation and also minimum salaries increasing in Spain uh, material in the last, in the last years. Uh, Mauricio has already pointed out the positive impact of the reduction of uh, the cost of energy in our accounts, amounting uh, to 120 million euros. And that has also been uh, a tailwind in our, in our OPEX performance. Let me finish with the cash generated uh, by the company, a very strong cash uh, generation by the company at 2.2 billion uh, euros, 19% uh, increase year on year, and basically uh, net debt position already at 2.0C levels, so very healthy and a strong position, even better than in 2019. And with that, basically available cash and available credit lines of more than uh, 5 billion euros that uh, should ensure to everyone that uh, future dividend payments, especially in 2024, and debt repayments that are material in 2024 can be easily managed by, by the company. Uh, let me finish with a, with a remark. Uh, all of you know that uh, we have in a week, uh, hopefully, uh, the Capital Markets Day, we will be explaining, uh, we'll providing some guidance and update to our uh, 2022 to 2026 uh, strategic plan. So uh, I would ask you to hold questions related to guidance for this year and for the strategic plan to that event uh, so that we can focus the conversation today in the results of 2023. And that's, that's all from my side. Thank you very much. I don't know, Maurice, if you want to add anything. Thank you, everyone. Operator, we are we are ready to start with the Q and A. The floor is now open for your question. To ask a question this time, please press star then the number one on your telephone keypad. We'll pause for just a moment to compile the Q and A roster. Our first question comes from the line of Luis Prieto with Kepler. Your line is open. Good afternoon. Thanks for taking my questions. Uh, two from me. The first, the first one, you have explained the moving parts of the sharp increase in commercial revenue per passenger observed last year. But why the marked jump in Q4 and not before uh, a meaningful jump? Is it a d direct function of the jump in traffic? Any idea you could provide us with in terms of average ticket per passenger to, to give an explanation to this? And the second question would be that there seems to have been a relevant change in traffic behavior over the last few months. Uh, I'm obviously, given what you said, um, not going to ask you to provide any guidance before the CMD, but how stable do you think all of this is at the moment? Thank you. Hello, Luis. Uh, this is Ignacio speaking. Thank you very much for, for your question. I understand your question was related to the last quarter of uh, 2023 related to commercial revenues. Is that, is that right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Well, what you, you have seen, a, I think, a combination of, of, of effects. Traffic has performed very well in the last quarter of the year. Uh, we were discussing speed of recovery uh, was faster those, those months, although are, are weak months. Two, we are already seeing uh, some of the uh, uh, latest awards to some of our categories uh, adding to these, to these uh, commercial activities. Third, we have been adding more, more surface to our activities. So it's a, it's, it's a combination. And, and on top of that, I also highlight from a pure uh, accounting standpoint, the max uh, signing some of those latest contracts are, are also contrib contributing this, in, the, in this quarter. Uh, Luis. With respect to traffic, uh, of course, we are, we are very happy with the performance of traffic. We have seen 
uh, November, December performing very strongly. Uh, there is a public information that we have already shared on the performance of January. What we have seen is so, so far in Feb is not is not bad. Uh, but Luis, uh, with respect to perceptions and guidance, I, I would kindly ask you to to hold until until Thursday next week. It's just it's just eight days. But if, if I may, if I, if I may rephrase my question just, just a little bit, uh, in view of what you have seen, there's nothing that leads you to believe that it's not sustainable, is it? Um, it is a sustainable trend. Can, there's nothing abnormal. Well, what we, what we are seeing is that uh, the traffic performance in December and January has been uh, uh, has been performing very very strongly. So mm -hmm. so far so good with respect to impact yeah. of all what is happening out there. On, uh, on traffic in the following months. That's the kind of discussion that we would like to have with you on, on Thursday next week. Perfect. Understood. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Christian Nadelku with UBS. Your line is open. Hi, thank you very much for taking my questions. Um, the first one is on the Spanish network OPEX. 2024 and the sort of the moving parts there. Particular, um, I think we can see on your slide 20 that your other operating expenses, excluding electricity, Q4 are up 29% year over year. A meaningful step up in um, in that line. So I was curious what is driving that and how we should think about um, that that line going forward. But really so, how we should think about electricity cost as we're seeing the, um, the electric electricity prices coming down. Secondly, <clears throat> slide 16, it's very helpful to see the duty-free rents collected per passenger. One trend that I, that I notice here is um, in Q4, your duty-free rents collected per passenger are up 11% versus 19. In the first nine months, these are up 24%. So there is a material deceleration in duty rents collected per passenger in Q4. Is this related to a slowdown in passenger spending retail? Have to do with rising nominal guarantees, or can you give us a bit more color there? So how should we think of this line going forward in 2024? Last one, if I may, more of a technical question, but. We are seeing for the full year, MAG revenue is 155 million, straight line depreciation 60 million. Very difficult for us to model with precision these lines, but give us any any help there, any color, at least directionally. Do you expect the MAG revenues recognized to, to grow over the next couple of years, well above 150 million, or will they come down? Well, so on the straight line depreciation, should you take the 30 million in Q4 and annualize it? Is that the new normal or any any color or indication that would help? Thank you. Thank you, Christian. There's a, a long list. Uh, I hope I will be able to remember all your questions and provide uh, good answers, which is more important, I think. Uh, I think your first question was related to uh, page 20 and the breakdown of uh, other operating expenses uh, for the network in Spain, if I'm right. And I think you were highlighting the increase that, uh, that uh, you have seen uh, excluding electricity and in particular in the last, in the last, in the last quarter. Uh, but I would like to, to, to share with you that in the last quarter what we have had is a, 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 a provision related to the DF7. Some of uh, some court rulings uh, have been have been issued that have not been in our favor. So we have decided to 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 provide uh, for those concepts, and that uh, that has been a bit more than 10 million euros, and that's that, that's impacting that's impacting the last quarter in the category of other that uh, you you will see in a slide in a slide 20. Uh, and that's that's something that uh, uh, that uh, that is not that is negatively adding, of course, to, to, to the performance of uh, other operating expenses. Uh, I think your question, Christian, you also highlighted uh, or you comment on, on electricity. As, as, as you know, the company uh, signed this um, signed a long-term supply contract for a few years uh, with our recurrent uh, providers, 
and part of that contract, around 30%, uh, was provided. Uh, is going to be provided at fixed at fixed prices. So we'll be taking advantage, uh, of course, of the better prices of energy, and we have been taking advantage um, in the past in the past weeks, and hopefully it's, it's happening these, these days as well. But having said all that, uh, taking advantage of this soft market, the, the, the company is also very active and is analyzing options to hedge, uh, to potentially hedge a bit more. So that we that we can mitigate the potential of volatility coming from that uh, uh, item in our cost structure in the future. Uh, we don't know what is going to happen with gas prices, electricity prices. So going above that level is something that we are that we are analyzing and, and materially considering. Um, I think you also refer to uh, Max. And uh, uh, that was your last question, but this one in between. Uh, I will ask you again. With respect to Max, uh, I think you, you were referring at the performance that is difficult to, to anticipate. Uh, our plan this week is to share with you uh, the calendar, the schedule of Max per category uh, for the whole life of the strategic plan. Uh, so 2024, 2025, 2025, and 2026. So you will, you will have that, that visibility. What is happening and, and why, why they have increased uh, in some categories and lineizations are or straight lining are, inc are increasing uh, what you have seen in, in for example in duty free is that the new contract kicking in October uh, well November the first and those marks are higher than the ones that uh, we had before so that's 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 why uh, that's contributing a, a bit more with respect to a straight lining that you will see in a slide uh, 13 those 59. That, that number is increasing because our uh, the average life of, of our commercial contracts is uh, is very low because we have awarded very recently uh, a, a number of contracts, for example, food and beverage for Madrid, and also um, and also the, 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 the duty free that I was mentioning earlier. So the the new where our contracts are, the higher that number is going to be. I'm referring to the 59.1. Uh, if our portfolio of contracts gets older, expire, we'll have the opposite, the opposite effect in the in the following in the following years. And I think that uh, those are all the questions that uh, you raised, Christian, that I can remember. I would ask for yeah, your help. I'm missing something. That's very that's very helpful. Just that in the middle um, was about um, duty free rents collected. Seems that in Q4 there's a deceleration. If I look at your slide yeah. 16, duty free rents collected per pack, the 19 are up 11 percent, while in the first nine months they're up 24 percent. So I'm just asking if you're seeing a slowdown in um, your um, spending, retail spending in the airports, or is, is there any other effect on the marks there? Or, or can, I'm just trying to to get us here on 24. Do you actually think that? number can grow, the rent collected per tax can grow at the end of the day. Thank you. No, no, no it's, it's, it's a very good point, so happy, happy to address it, uh, Christian, I'm happy to remember, and thank you for remembering it. Uh, what, what is happening, there is a normal thing in airports, uh, the contracts, the new contracts started November the 1st, uh, and it's true that uh, most of our duty-free activity has been transferred, uh, there has to be change with respect to the operator. But uh, as part of our uh, RFP, there were obligations related to new concepts, new layouts, new brands. Uh, so some construction works are taking place in the duty-free activities. Uh, and that's affecting some of the duty-free surface, and that might be affecting the uh, variable rents uh, that we are collecting in, in that activity in this specific quarter that you were highlighting, Christian. Thank you. And then these are done. The, the, refurbish, the refurbishment activities are done in Q4, no longer impacting Q1. Sorry, I couldn't follow you. There was some background noise. The, 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 the construction work and refurbishing yeah. is done in Q4. Yeah. yeah that's, that's, Thank you very much. That's likely to finish, uh, hopefully, in the following weeks. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Nicolo Pessina with Media Banca. Your line is open. Yes, good afternoon all, and thanks for taking my questions. Uh, uh, the first one on the 2025 tariff, uh, uh, 
do you calculate uh, again a P factor above one percent, uh, and do you plan to ask Spanish authorities again the permission to apply a P factor above one uh, percent, uh, as we have seen uh, uh, for the 2024 tariff? Um, second question, uh, if you can remind us if there is any uh, agreement uh, already in place uh, with the trade unions uh, uh, for salary increases over 2024 and 2025. And the final question on uh, M&A, if you can confirm uh, you are considering uh, um, the acquisition of Edinburgh Airport. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola. Happy to, to speak with you. Uh, I think with respect to 2025 tariffs, uh, we'll have a full discussion next week, but uh, I'm, I'm happy to share that the P, P index is a function of uh, evolution change uh, that take place previously. So we were able to have a P index higher uh, than, than usual uh, this, for this year because uh, the P index was taken into account of what happened in 2022. So uh, given that uh, we are starting at those high levels, this very likely that in the future what we will see is much smaller increases because the starting, the starting point is, is, already, is already much much higher. So it, it, it's a function of any single index of what has happened in the, in the past. So that's, that's, the, that's the feedback that I would give you. With respect to salary increases, uh, the agreement that is, already, is, is still in place is uh, up to the 2024, up to, up to this year. So that, uh, that's the three-year agreement signed. Uh, by the unions with the Spanish government, and, 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 and AINA is regulated, is, is part, as you know, with respect to compensation of that, of that agreement. So that's close, uh, up to 2020, 2024. Uh, with respect to M&A, uh, Nicola, your question was about? Um, I couldn't hear you, you. I think you referred to a specific airport, but I couldn't hear the name. Edinburgh. Edinburgh. Okay, Edinburgh. Yeah, because there have been some, some press news. Uh, uh, Nicola, what I can say with you is that uh, uh, INA is, is, is the largest and top one airport operator globally speaking and in terms of, of performance. Uh, we have a healthy position, and when there is an opportunity out there, wherever uh, uh, that is available, uh, we, we may decide to look at that. However, uh, that can be a, a, any airport globally speaking, but also always subject to all our internal criteria of risk return. Uh, with respect to Edinburgh, there has been leakage uh, by presses. Uh, the company is not confirming, rejecting, or saying anything. Um, and what I can say with you is what I, what I have said before, Nicole. Um, I think the company has in, in, uh, been the number one leader and, and, and with an intention to increase uh, the international uh, EBITDA coming from international activities. We we'll explore opportunities, and we will reject opportunities, uh, always subject to, uh, to a strict criteria of risk return. Very clear. Uh, Thanks. Uh, 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 Nico, the chairman would like to, to add some more words. Yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, this is uh, Mauricio Lucena again. Yeah, I completely share what uh, Ignacio Castejón has uh, just said. I would uh, just uh, add uh, a general uh, reflection. Our top uh, priority uh, at present is to consolidate uh, what we have achieved abroad. Uh, in this case, I'm referring to Brazil. I think that uh, we have to, as, as a company, we have uh, to digest uh, correctly the 20% of uh, Brazilian uh, air traffic, which uh, is a considerable amount. But uh, this uh, is compatible with uh, what we consider our responsibility, which is, as Ignacio Castejón said, to uh, analyze uh, any opportunity as, uh, by the way, all our competitors uh, do all the time. I mean, uh, this, we are not uh, different compared to our competitors, to our peers. Uh, but I would, I would like uh, to clearly state that uh, Brazil is our uh, priority in the sense that uh, we want to consolidate what we are already doing and, uh, in general, our international ap approach uh, at present is what we could uh, call 
opportunistic, opportunistic in the sense that we don't have, um, let's say, a specific uh, target. Uh, we are open to analyze any opportunity, but uh, we are not impatient, in other words. We will uh, be very happy if, if in a uh, few years uh, in the future we um, communicate to the market that we have not uh, purchased anything else. But uh, at the same time, uh, we would be happy if uh, we consider that we have, uh, we, we can find a good international opportunity, uh, you know, concerning always uh, the quality of the asset, uh, the price, the regulatory uh, risk, uh, and, 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 and so on. Uh, okay, so uh, I hope that uh, my uh, intervention has uh, helped to clarify or to, uh, in other words, to add uh, some information to what uh, very correctly uh, Ignacio said before. Thank you. Absolutely, yes, very helpful. Our next question comes from the line of Graham Hunt with Jeffries. Your line is open. Thanks very much. I'll, I'll keep it just to two questions. Um, just coming back to the, I think, just over 10 million provision you mentioned, I think you said it was related to the DS7 um, disputes. Um, can I just get a sense of, is that the, the entire scope of the risk there, or is there, you know, is, should we anticipate potential for further provisions um, going into 2024? Just trying to understand the scope of risk there. Um, and then, if I could ask on duty-free, I wonder if you could just give us your thoughts on sort of the tail that you've been seeing from the British traveller you know, since Brexit uh, and their access to duty free. Um, you know, what, can you just dig into some of the details of what is going on there, maybe some of the specific verticals within duty free which are benefiting or, or the specific travel routes which are, you're seeing the biggest tail in, just trying to drill into what has obviously been a very positive trend for, for you over the past couple of years. Thanks. Thank you, Ron. This is Ignatius speaking. Uh, I think your first question, uh, this, this provision is related to some core rulings with respect to uh, business activities that uh, the company is defending and is still defending that uh, shouldn't be affected by DF7. And, uh, however, we have we have got some court rulings that are applying the DF7 to some, to some of those business lines that uh, our understanding is that they, they are excluded, that they, they, uh, DF7 should be, shouldn't be applicable. So after getting those, those court rulings, initial court rulings, uh, the company has decided to, to, to provide for, for that. Uh, with respect to the future, it's difficult to say because the, 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 there are a number of uh, uh, court proceedings taking place with respect to some of these activities. We are we are doing our best in order to reach some some agreements when there is a, when it makes sense uh, with our, with our tenants. But uh, the evolution will depend on, on on future court court rulings following that criteria or changing the criteria because we we are seeing different criteria being applied. Uh, depending on the specific judge, depending on the specific uh, court. In general, uh, the company feels that it's the right decision to provide for this uh, 11.7, if I remember well, related to, to the, the, that specific category, and we'll take the, the similar approach in the following months if we perceive that that trend uh, remains as we have seen so, so far. With respect to duty-free, you were asking about the British passengers. Uh, I think that there are two main trends behind what's, what, what's happening. Uh, I think the change in the regulation in the UK uh, is helping us a lot and is, of course, affect, negatively affecting uh, the British airports. Uh, why? Because they have reduced the offer uh, that they can provide on a tax-free basis to their passengers uh, and is very limited to tobacco and alcohol. So we are benefiting, uh, benefiting or taking advantage of that limitation. That is a change in regulation that uh, was approved a few years ago in the UK. And simultaneously, given that uh, we have all the British passengers becoming non-European Union and not having that kind of limitation in our airports, those passengers being our largest uh, customer base 
after the, the Spaniards, after uh, the domestic, is, is helping a lot. If you ask me about the specific details, uh, what, I, what I can share with you is that uh, on average, sales per packs at this moment in time of uh, UK passengers are, are, are around six, six, three euros higher than, um, than the total average of that, of that activity. So the, the delta between a non-breed and, and, and a British passenger is, is material for, for, for this activity. They are taking advantage of, a, of, a, of course, of the duty-free experience in, in Spain. If you add uh, to that all the renovation of our duty-free uh, duty activities taking place in Araina, that, uh, that, that's helping a lot, uh, our p and that is playing our 23.5% increase in, in, that, in that activity. Juan, I hope I have answered your, your question. Yes, thanks very much. My pleasure. Our next question comes from the line of Andrew Lobenbury. With Bart, please. Your line is open. Oh, hi there. I've got uh, two questions. Really? Um, the first one is, is looking at the change in the operating cash flow compared to the EBITDA, because uh, the EBITDA was up a billion and the operating cash flow was up 400. So can you um, talk us through the, the, the very big difference uh, in change of operating cash flow against EBITDA and you know, help us understand you know, how we should think about uh, EBITDA translating into cash uh, into the future. And then the second question, I'm aware you might try and put it off till, till next week, but let me ask. Um, you were very careful uh, with your answers around M&A and your thinking around external expansion. I'm very keen to explain that you're, you're going to be patient, not in a hurry. And yet the business is generating cash flows. So uh, how are you going to think about incorporating shareholder returns uh, in the context of, of an external uh, inorganic growth, which is going to be uh, lumpy and hard to predict? Thank you, Andrew. This is, this is, this is Ignatius speaking. On, on operating cash flow, uh, I think uh, what is happening, if we, we compare, for example, uh, operating cash flow to profit before tax, uh, or I can, I can discuss with you, Andrew, a few, a few changes that we have seen uh, this, this year. I think the first one in EBITDA, uh, we have discussed, we have already discussed the, the reversal of the impairment. That's 155 million, that is a non-cash item. We have also had some financial items that are non-gas items, such as, for example, closing a derivative position. Uh, there is a significant impact coming to cash flow going out related to taxes. Uh, the tax bill last year, from a payment standpoint, was 177. In 2023, we have had 447 million uh, euros of uh, cash going out. So that's, that's around uh, almost 300. With respect to changes in working capital, you will have seen a small negative uh, impact. That's because at the end of 2022, uh, we have a number of uh, short-term suppliers that invoice us very late in December, and those invoices were not paid until 2023. So in, we have a positive impact in 2022, and that's why we have a small negative, a small negative one uh, this, this this year. And that's that, that's really what is what, what, what is happening, uh, uh, Andrew. So those are the main the main drivers. Uh, some non finance some non cash items related to finance, uh, the impairment that is a non cash item. Uh, some write off of, of financial item assets related to DF7. Uh, the negative movement, but a small on the working capital and the material increase in tax in tax payments, uh, Andrew. That that would be all. And the MAG is not a big part of it? The MAG, you said? Yeah, of course, the MAG, uh, sorry, that's, that's a good point. Of course, the MAG, the, the MAG is affecting because it's a non, it's a non cash item. You, you are totally right. But uh, when you, when, I just want to be very, very careful. When we are talking about MAG, Andrew, and the non cash item nature of MAG, uh, what we are referring is to the straight line in another adjustment, because that's the adjustment that uh, is a long-term one that related to uh, the newer contracts. So that's generating more EBITDA than cash. 
when we look at the MAC revenue to be invoiced, that is the 140 and 54.9 million euros, uh, Andrew, that's, that's normally max that are invoiced and collected uh, very early in the, in the year following when that uh, revenue has been, has been accrued. So that's, that's also affecting a bit, but the significant, I wouldn't use the word significant, but uh, the, the important effect from an accounting standpoint of the straight lining this year is 59, that is, is also on cast, as you, as you correctly highlighted, Andrew. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think you raised another question on, on, on M&A. Mm, yeah, the, very, the, the, the variability of M&A and how that impacts what you think about shareholder return. Okay. Well, uh, uh, let, me, let me say very clearly, uh, uh, the company has only invested and will only explore opportunities in which equity RR uh, makes sense. It's attractive from a risk-reward standpoint. So that's the value creation filter that we always apply to any single transaction or opportunity that has been analyzed uh, that, and that could be analyzed, Andrew. So we are very careful and very serious so that any equity RR uh, makes sense in the long term uh, for the company and, of course, for the company's shareholders. Uh, dividend payout is that 80% of uh, the individual net income uh, this year has increased materially for our shareholders, and we are hopeful that uh, that increase will, uh, of those levels will remain there so our shareholders can benefit from that, from that uh, generation. Uh, the, the chairman would like to add some further color to my answer. Thank you. Uh, this is Mauricio Lucena again. I uh, once more uh, I would like to to, to convey that uh, of course I, I share the the reflection of uh, Ignacio Castejón, and again I I would only like to complement it. Mm, and I would mm, kindly ask uh, analysts and investors uh, who in the past and at present have uh, trusted AENA, uh, how it is managed. Uh, uh, they have trusted uh, our uh, board of directors, our management. And I would kindly ask that uh, we analyze uh, carefully, honestly, the, the, the track record uh, of AENA internationally. Uh, if you analyze uh, Luton, if you analyze uh, Colombia, which uh, is uh, ending, uh, in Cali, Cartagena de Indias, if you analyze uh, Mexico, uh, GAP, uh, we, we would uh, unanimously conclude that uh, these have been uh, very good uh, investments, uh, very good investments. So I hope, uh, and of course, uh, this, uh, of, of course, does not mean that uh, any uh, potential uh, international operation is uh, adequate for AENA, of course. But uh, when I try to look uh, carefully at uh, Brazil uh, and our investments and acquisitions there, and I project uh, them in the future, in the next 30, 35 years, I'm sure because uh, I'm, I'm seeing how our uh, management team and our employees, they are working I, I'm, I'm yeah, now being a privileged uh, witness of uh, how our financials uh, in uh, Brazil are evolving. Of course, you know that at the beginning of a concession, you have uh, to um, assume uh, capex, you have to assume debt. But in the long term, I'm sure so far that uh, Brazil will uh, also uh, be a, a very good uh, investment, a, a very good bet for AENA, and when I refer to AENA, I'm referring to its uh, shareholders, uh, which are, you know, our uh, most uh, precious uh, treasure. So um, I, I'm just uh, trying to, to say that uh, um, please uh, trust uh, our uh, board, our uh, management team, because uh, honestly, we will only... Uh, Bet for new operations if uh, we are uh, quite, quite, quite sure 
that uh, the figures uh, will be the adequate ones. Uh, we are very uh, aware that uh, investing in as money uh, is shareholders' money, and uh, we, we will bear this in mind all the time. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Johannes Braun with Stifle Europe. Your line is open. Questions. I have um, two as well. Um, the first one would be on the 4.1% uh, increase of fees this year. Um, my question would be how the airlines reacted on that. Um, and I'm just asking because Ryanair was in the press saying that they will not open five new bases in Spain if the fee increase goes ahead. We're just trying to get a feeling of the risk of, for, for traffic growth. Um, and then secondly, I think uh, at Luton Airport, uh, the ABDA in Q4 was down quite a bit year over year. And I think that was due to a 30 million impairment. Um, so just curious what, what happened there, please. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I will uh, take uh, the first question, the airport uh, charges, the, the airport uh, tariffs. Well, uh, yes, this is uh, something that uh, surprises me every year. I mean, <laughs> I cannot understand why we uh, always uh, finish in a hot debate uh, between AENA and on the other side, uh, the airlines. You know, uh, the airlines are our precious uh, clients, our customers, our partners. Uh, we really appreciate them. Uh, we, are, we feel uh, very fortunate to live uh, together with uh, some of the most uh, important airlines in the world. Uh, Ryanair, the uh, the airlines within the IAG group, uh, etc. Uh, they have uh, very good uh, managers. So the only thing that I try to reivindicate is uh, that uh, I'm as uh, shareholders, they deserve the ex exactly the same consideration as uh, the shareholders of uh, anyone else specifically the airlines. So when uh, the airlines uh, frequently question the increase, uh, the potential increase of our airport charges, I can just uh, say, one, uh, we have shareholders, which again are, are, are at least, uh, they have at least the same quality as uh, the shareholders of the airlines. Second, uh, it is in the interest of uh, the airlines that the long-term quality of the Spanish airports and INS airports is preserved, and this uh, can only be achieved uh, through a robust uh, regulatory framework uh, which must be followed uh, each year line by line, and this was uh, what explained the 4.09% increase of 2024 tariffs. And third, which is uh, in a secret, that the, we are uh, probably um, the most efficient airport uh, company in the world. This is the only secret. And uh, I would like that, uh, that this is uh, recognized because on the other hand, uh, in uh, relative terms, the increases of uh, profits, of the 2023 profits, have been much higher. Again, uh, uh, in relative terms, uh, the increase of profits have been much higher in the case of uh, airlines. And I don't see there any, any debate. And finally, uh, take into account, I, I, I mean, I, I'm conveying it to you, but I know that you know this uh, very well. Uh, probably I'm speaking uh, more uh, broadly. Uh, take into account that uh, from 2015 to uh, 2023, 
nominally airport charges uh, in Spain decreased by more uh, than 11%, and in real terms, uh, it, um, it means taking into account uh, inflation from 2015 to 2023, airport charges in real terms have uh, they have decreased uh, 31, uh, more than 30 percent in real terms. So, um, I, I, I would wonder uh, this, uh, this is sustainable in the long term if you take into account the necessary future investments in uh, Spanish airports, in the quality, in safety and security, and, and so on. Well, this is uh, something that uh, we, uh, together with the airlines, must uh, reflect on. And if we, for uh, a moment, forget the short-term interest, probably we will conclude that it makes uh, complete sense that uh, the remuneration of uh, AENA shareholders uh, through the regulatory framework, which is you um, without... Uh, Faculties, uh, you can recover the OPEX and your CAPEX is reasonably uh, remunerated. It's uh, a scheme that uh, I would say makes sense, and we, it is uh, the shared responsibility of all the air transport uh, sector actors to uh, preserve this uh, model uh, for the benefit of the quality of uh, airports, air traffic, tourism, and uh, ultimately the functioning of the Spanish economy. Thank yeah, you. Th 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 thanks for, I mean, I, I agree, or I tend to agree with, with your thoughts. Uh, but, I mean, more concretely, did Ryanair come back to you uh, in terms of those five new bases that they plan to um, open this year, or no? Uh, you, you, uh, you are asking if uh, after the approval of the new airport tariffs for 2024, if uh, Ryanair has uh, come back to us, uh, could, could you please clarify that? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Uh, no, uh, I, I, this public message that I have now uh, elaborated, it is exactly the same that I conveyed to Ryanair and uh, all, the, all the airlines. Um, so I think that in the end, they understand uh, our point. So, no, I, I don't have uh, any novelty. Thank you. Thank you. Johannes, I, I think you had a, another question with respect to Luton performance. So can you please clarify what you were really seeking so that I can address your point properly? I think Johannes has been cut by the operator. So let's move, let, let's move to the next question. Uh, I think it's Darío, if I'm not mistaken. Our next question comes from the line of Darío Maguillon with BNP Paribas. Your line is open. Hi, good afternoon. Um, three questions. Uh, one on the situation with the Catalonian airports, you know, about local parties trying to um, push to split AINA. Just wanted an update there and whether it's um, really legally possible. Um, question number two. Um, I see that the airlines are planning to increase uh, seat capacity for like the next um, nine months by 10% year on year. Uh, this, looks, this looks very bullish. Um, so um, in this context, what impact are you seeing from you know, the Pratt & Whitney engine issues or the uh, delays in deliveries of airplanes? And the third question is more a technical question. Um, there is a cap on the year-on-year -year increase in tariffs, 
Um, can you remind us what this cap will be uh, in 2025? Thanks. Thank you, uh, Dario. Uh, I will take uh, the first uh, question. My answer has not uh, changed uh, an inch uh, since last time we uh, we spoke. Concerning the possible transfer uh, of the ownership or management of the airports in Catalonia, um, uh, really believe me, uh, this is, uh, I said it uh, a few months ago, this is empty noise. Uh, I think that everybody agrees that uh, AENA's model functions very, very well and uh, it's functioning benefits uh, all the regions, including uh, Catalonia. So, mm, uh, and, you know, on the other hand, there's a very strong 2014 law that uh, defines uh, how the uh, AINA works in terms of its uh, uh, regulated activity. And uh, finally, uh, we have uh, a hybrid uh, composition uh, of uh, ownership, 51% belongs to the Spanish government, 49% belongs to uh, private investors, uh, we are a listed company, so this um, is uh, another clear uh, sign that uh, the model uh, will be preserved. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marisi. I'll, I'll, uh, Dario, I'll, I'll, I'll address, uh, I think there were two more questions. Uh, let me start with the third. With respect to 2025 tariff, um, I think I don't want to be rude, Dario, but uh, we are going to cover guidance future next week, but uh, I think 2025 tariff will be, will be following regulation as, as, as applicable. So we'll start from the map. Uh, P index will be, will be applied. Uh, and there will be the recurrent technical adjustments related to dilution quality, etc., so that we can calculate the EMAC applicable for the year. You are aware of the restrictions applicable in our regulation that we have to comply with the uh, EMAP index by or taking into account the P index as a restriction, as a cap, and also the EMAC applicable in the previous year, and taking into account those caps. That will be the tariff that hopefully will be will become applicable in twenty in twenty twenty five. I think you raised some questions on the, uh, the the other question you raised was related to seat capacity and potential disruptions on aircraft fleet. Uh, I think we, we, we are working with the with the slots communicated to to us, and we are working with the information communicated to us to by by the airlines. So uh, we understand that the airlines when they share all that information from a planning standpoint with us, they are taking into account all the potential disruption that they may have related to, to, to those events. Okay. Thank you, Ignacio. So that 10% year, year increase, it actually may be possible. Uh, that will why don't we have that kind of discussion on, on Thursday next week? Uh, sure. When, uh, when you, you have more info from us, uh, and I'm sure that uh, uh, we can talk uh, with all that information in front of us and have a more meaningful conversation. Is, is that okay? okay? Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next question comes from the line of Martin Hotel with Bank of America. Your turn is open. Uh, yes, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for taking my questions. Uh, I will try to be brief. Um, I have a, just a technical question on, on slide number 12, where you uh, disclosed that there was a, a dilution effect in regulated revenue of 94 million in 2023, which I think is actually uh, quite, quite relevant. Um, for 2024, could you do something proactively to, to perhaps to, to reduce that dilution? Can you change the tariff structure a, 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 a little bit, or, or actually should, we should expect uh, continued dilution? And historically, when traffic goes up, also you have you have pretty high high dilution. No, 
numbers. Could you could you just just share some some color on on that on that particular um, topic? Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Uh, that's, that, that's a good question. Uh, I think my, my short answer to be, to be uh, brief and, and, and sharp is that uh, uh, in 2026, uh, the different uh, interim caps that were applicable uh, during the interim regime of our regulation wouldn't be applicable. So um, that uh, would be a situation in which we, j we are just postponing that cash collation, collection by a couple of years and, of course, duly, duly capitalized. Uh, well, of course, we work and try to have a better under, uh, we work on how to apply the EMAC every year to all the different cost centers and business activities of the company. We have some restrictions that are applicable in order to have those cost centers operating at a, a break even uh, in the medium to long term. Uh, so, of course, the company does uh, their best. Uh, we, we do our best to mitigate uh, that dilution. Uh, having said that, uh, Many times what happens is that traffic performs in a manner that is a bit different from our plans, and the illusion becomes a higher number that we were, that we were expecting. Uh, in the last quarter, what we have seen is a trend that has been different to the previous trend through, through the year, in which the illusion was increasing, and we have had concentration. Uh, and the reason for the concentration has been the, uh, the normal uh, pattern that we see in many years, in which the last quarter of the year, uh, airports that are more expensive, such as Madrid and Barcelona, from a tariff standpoint, uh, attract more passengers, relatively speaking. Uh, the other factor of the other driver explaining the concentration in that quarter has been that the recovery pace of those big airports at the end of this year has been higher than the recovery of the rest of the, of the network. So that has also contrib contributed. Uh, unless you have any... Follow us, Martin. I think we can move to the next question with Elodie. Thank you. Next question comes from the line of Elodie Rao with JP Morgan. Your line is open. Hi, thanks. Um, I just had one left um, on capacity expansion on, on both Barcelona and Madrid. Uh, we know Mar Barcelona is currently at um, above 90%, I think, in terms of utilization. Um, so, given the news, and you, you said it was all noise, but um, we know the, the, the CapEx plan has been put on hold. Uh, I think it was 1.7 billion. Is there any, um, any update on that, um, or is this on, on hold until there is more clarification with uh, the future of, of Barcelona. And on Madrid, we know about the 2.4 billion, but is this um, any update or like, could, could you give us some more details on how this will play out? Thank you. Hello, this is uh, Mauricio Lucena again. Uh, we, we uh, concerning the potential expansion of uh, Barcelona Airport, I think that we are mm, where we were where we were uh, a few months ago. I think that uh, the the will of Aena and the Spanish government is crystal clear, and uh, so far I don't see. Uh, any novelty concerning the uh, only relevant uh, actor, which is, uh, I mean, only relevant actor for the decision, which is the Catalan government. Uh, the Catalan government is uh, the, uh, the, the institution that uh, in the future should uh, publicly explain what uh, decision, what uh, proposal it has for for the for the uh, Barcelona airport, and uh, of course this proposal should be uh, technically specified in terms of uh, in terms of airport language, uh, not, not uh, abstract concepts. Uh, in terms of uh, what uh, our aeronautical engineers uh, deal with. 
on uh, I don't see any uh, move uh, in this sense. I think that the Catalan government uh, it is where it was uh, not only a few months ago, but uh, I would uh, say uh, two and a half uh, years ago. So <laughs> in the end, this is a, a question for for the Catalan government uh, because we uh, taking into account the and environmental issues, we cannot uh, change anything in the Barcelona airport without the support of uh, of the Spanish uh, of the uh, of the Catalan government. Um, so this is uh, what uh, I think is relevant so far. Our next question comes from the line of Rosandra Doser, which HSBC. Your line is open. Yes, hello. Uh, thank you for taking my questions. Um, first, maybe a follow-up. Uh, Elodie asked also about the um, CAPEX at Madrid airport. Um, I understand from press that the largest part of this CAPEX refers to Terminal 4. What is the feedback you receive from Iberia on increased CAPEX and to which extent does this CAPEX depend on the merger between Aero Europa and Iberia and the shift of Aero Europa to Terminal 4? Uh, second, um, I understand from press that at many airports you have introduced new incentives this year. Uh, could you please help understand the magnitude of these incentives, maybe relate them to the tariff increase? Um, and do you see a risk that some airlines will shift capacities from airports with no incentives to airports with new incentives in order to optimize the net impact of the tariff increase? And third, um, I understand that the Spanish government plans to progressively reduce the 40 hours working week uh, without a reduction in wages over the next two years. Uh, if this was to happen, could you please talk about implications for AINA? Thank you very much. Thank you. My pleasure. That was a long list. Uh, <laughs> let, me, let me try to help you with, uh, with, with my answers. Uh, with respect to Madrid plans, uh, I'm not trying to defer to next week, but uh, our plan is setting our our views and plans on the Madrid expansion uh, more carefully and with detail uh, on Thursday of next week. That is, is, is a play that we are hopeful that uh, will will take place. Take place, sorry, as the support of uh, many stakeholders and is not only affecting T4, and I think as you as you were pointing out, Rosandra, but also might be affecting T1, T2, T2 and T3, getting a, a single terminal in the in the future. So that's, that's a project that we are helpful that uh, will get crystallized uh, during DORA 3 um, and, and, DORA, and DORA 4. Uh, I think uh, on, on CAPEX, um, we are seeing CAPEX, regulated CAPEX increasing, uh, Rusandra. Uh, that's, that's, the, that's the short answer in the, in the, next, DORA, in the next DORA period. Uh, you also raised a question with respect to uh, working hours. Uh, we don't expect a material impact at, uh, at AINA uh, with respect to working hours given, given the current situation of, of, of the company. So that, that shouldn't be a fact. Uh, shouldn't be a, a thing that, uh, that might materially affect uh, oil operating cost of the company and, and staff cost. You raised the point on, on incentives. Uh, the financial assessment is, uh, will not have a material effect. And, and, and I would say, uh, if, if, if any, will be will be positive. Uh, why? Because we are we are only contributing partially to the to the tariff, to the passenger tariff. As you know, that's not the whole tariff that the company that the AINA gets. Uh, we get a whole, whole, whole part of our charges are, are explained by movements, by uses of our facilities, etc. So we are still getting that uh, too. Uh, and, and the other reason, uh, the second reason is all the commercial revenue that will be attracting with those incremental volumes. That uh, we are hopeful that will be, attract, uh, will be attracting with these with these incentives. Uh, I think you raised the point on how that could affect the network, etc. We have some protections, so there has to be a, a real net increase in the network because of uh, all those incentives that uh, could be claimed by by airlines. 
So there, there, there shouldn't be there a leakage or a, or a dilution affecting the, the company because of that impact. Um, and I think that was it. But uh, Rusan, let me say that. Is that what, if Thank I you very that. much. Thank you very okay. much. Maybe just a follow-up. What's the current average number of hours per week that your employees work? Uh, I think that, uh, uh, let me check with uh, HR, but I think we are at 37.5 uh, officially with shifts. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. I Thank will, you. I will, I will revert to you uh, to confirm uh, by category and by, by group. Thank you very much. Thanks. Our last question comes from the line of Jose Arroyas with Santander. Your line is open. Let me ask one question, please. Um, it's on OPEX. You previously mentioned the one off related to DF7 in the other uh, operating line, other operating costs, sorry. But I was wondering if there had been any other one off effects in some of the other cost items like PRM or security services that have increased in Q4 uh, significantly versus the nine months the run rate that we might not see in 2024. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Jose Manuel. Uh, uh, there have been, as you can see in the information provided, there have been cost increases uh, coming from um, basically uh, minimum salary increases, new contracts being awarded, uh, the new security contract uh, training, uh, more people being added to the organization. So I would say that uh, in general, Jose Manuel, uh, what you are seeing is a general trend, more than one-offs, uh, apart from the one that we highlighted related to uh, DF7 and some write offs related also to, to DF7. I think that was the last uh, question, uh, operator. So I think we can finish the conversation. There are no further questions at this time. I will turn it over to the speakers for closing remarks. Excellent. So thank you very much, everyone. It has been a very uh, helpful uh, meeting. Hope that uh, has been fruitful for you as well. I'm looking forward to seeing you uh, next week on, on Thursday. We're looking forward to it. Thank you very much.